For the occasion of my 100th video, I created a special stalker iceberg, and I said I would explain its elements eventually. We already covered the first and second layers, and now it's time to continue. Hello stalkers and welcome to the anomalous dugout. In this video we will take a look at the third layer of my stalker iceberg, the underground. Living Copies In clear sky, it is possible to find the dead body of the loner leader, Father Valerian, located in the Red Forest, near a space anomaly. However, if you go back to the cordon, you will realize that Valerian is actually still alive and well. How is that possible? Supposedly, this small detail was a leftover from a plot point that was eventually removed from the game during development. In the design documents for Anarchy Cell, the title that later became Clear Sky, we can read this. Strange things start in the zone. One and the same people are seen in different places simultaneously. And also, the player is copied by the Noosphere. The copy and the original get split. The original appears at the zone border, where it is picked up by the Clear Sky Patrol. It appears that the Noosphere, which is the informational field from which the anomalies in the zone draw their power, was supposed to become a self-aware entity and make strange things happen, such as copying stalkers, including Scar himself. Honestly, this could explain a lot of things. For starters, we know that Strelok's friend, named Feng, was shot down by a mercenary whose description matched Scar. But we also know from Clear Sky's storyline that Scar did not even meet with Feng. If Scar had a copy, it could very well be possible that it was the copy who dealt with Feng. Furthermore, some believe that the new sphere also copies mutants, explaining why there are always new monsters despite the fact that some can't seem to reproduce. In fact, here is another extract from Anarchy Cell's design document. This is the counterpart, a cut mutant supposed to be a wild and insane copy of stalkers, something like a mimic. I'm not totally sure, but I think a similar creature was planned for Stalker 2 back in 2011. So perhaps we will get this creepy monster in Heart of Chernobyl. Finally, I need to mention the fact that the random name generator allows for different NPCs to have the exact same name. It's probably an extremely rare occurrence, but I know for sure that it can happen. Actually, a hint about the copies, or simply a coincidence? Up to you to decide. Yentar Teleporters There are several areas where you can get out of bounds, but Yentar is probably one of the easiest map to get out of. Just run to the western side, and from there you can access the buildings behind the factory. In Clear Sky, you can use this method to get to the yard near the transition to the Red Forest. There, you will find several invisible teleporters that lead to out-of-bound areas from other maps. Supposedly, similar level transitions are hidden out-of-bounds in every map and can be used by speedrunners and glitchers. I believe similar teleporters also exist in Call of Pripyat. Not quite sure about Shadow of Chernobyl, though. Since the transitions are invisible, it can be a bit tricky to use them correctly. But with a bit of trial and error, you should be able to have an idea of where to walk in order to get to the place you wish for. It is even possible to be transported to the hill above the tunnel to Limonsk the one used by renegade snipers during the battle for the bridge. In fact, there is a famous shortcut that can be used to skip a large chunk of the game by getting there directly from the Great Swamps. Here is how to do it. 
First, get out of bounds in the northern part of the swamps. For that, use the hole in the fence and go towards the bridge. In the bushes, you should find some barbed wire. Stick to the right side of the wire and climb up. Second, run all the way to the correct teleporter. It is located in the southeastern part of the map, near the transition to the cordon. There it is, between these two rocks. Third, avoid the other teleporters and get down of the hill. Now you can get to Limansk. And voila! Brenter Brenter is one of Professor Sakharov's colleagues, mentioned in a mission briefing about bringing back a boar leg. While we do not learn much about Brenter himself, this detail shows us one important thing. There are other, more unseen ecologists working in the zone, and even possibly inside the very same bunker. In fact, Sakharov also mentions another unknown colleague, as well as his assistant, Semenov, who will replace Professor Kruglov in case he dies. Therefore, I believe that the bunker is not as empty as it seems, and a few more Hegeds are working in other unseen parts of the mobile lab. Indeed, the player is only allowed to access a small part of the contraption. Sure, we got to see a bit more in Call of Pripyat, where more rooms of a similar bunker were opened, but this is still not everything that there is to see. By looking closely at the building, we can clearly conclude that the lab has a second floor, so I would not be surprised if these other scientists mentioned by Sakharov were hidden there. Moreover, we can only wonder what kind of experiments are conducted in these unknown back rooms. Here's a small piece of dialogue to excite your imagination. Our research revealed that the eyes of the creatures called flesh in the common language are equipped with olfactory receptors. Thus, they can not only see with their eyes, but smell with them as well. We are getting ready for an operation on transplanting this miraculous eye to one of... <coughs> one of our voluntary assistants. I believe we are about to start a craze. Guide is an agent. Alright, this theory is quite a stretch, so bear with me. According to the legends and the stories, Guide is one of the first, if not the first, stalker. He is said to know the zone like the back of his hand, and he can guide you anywhere, even beyond the brain scorcher. It is often speculated that Guide was the one who showed the way to the Chernobyl power plant to Strelok and his squad. With such a background, you would expect that having a chat with Guide has to be one of the most interesting things that can happen to you in the zone. Unfortunately, this was far from the case. Indeed, when Mark Twain meets with Guide in Shadow of Chernobyl, their conversation is rather disappointing. Not only Guide does not recognize you, but he hasn't much to say. Sure, he remains essential to the plot, since meeting him is mandatory to get the good ending, but his character acts almost like another random NPC. So one theory that was made to explain the awkward dialogue between Mark Twain and Guide claims that the legendary man is in fact an agent of the sea consciousness. Just like Mark Twain, Guide would have reached the center of the zone and got too close to things he should not know, getting himself captured and turned into a marked agent. It is unknown what mission he was given, but he did help Mark Twain in his own task to search for Strelok. Perhaps their minds connected during this exchange and Guide's subconscious brainwashing pushed him to reveal the info about Doctor to Mark Twain without much talking. Going further, we know that it was Guide who led the military survivors of Operation Fairway to Pripyat. 
Did this really help them? Not really, considering they were trapped in the city and almost wiped out by the monolith and the mutants. Later on, Guide also brought Strelok to the military camp. Supposedly, in an old concept for Stalker 2 from the early 2010s, the Strelok seen in Call of Pripyat was to be a deception, a living copy, a clone sent by the Sea Consciousness to confuse and infiltrate the military. In that case, it would make sense for Guide to be the one leading Strelok if they were both agents. Personally, I don't really think this theory is true, but who knows. The zone is not growing. Now that is a hot topic. It is commonly assumed that the zone is growing, but is it really the case? I already investigated this question in detail in an old video. And here's what I found. According to the story, the zone expanded by 5 kilometers during the second disaster of 2006. However, this event is the birth of the anomalous zone itself, so it probably means that when the first anomalies were formed, they spread over a territory 5 kilometers larger than the radioactive zone from 1986. While the epicenter of the two zones are almost the same, there is no reason for their sizes to be similar, and as it turns out, the anomalous zone is slightly larger than the radioactive zone. But hey, this is just my interpretation, so I might be wrong. The tales also claim that the zone grows more when a stalker reaches the wish granter and makes a wish. Yet, we know that the monolith is fake, so this is clearly just a legend. In the end, there are only two sources warning us about the growth of the zone. The first is the Sea Consciousness representative, although he cannot be trusted, because he could just be saying this in order to trick Strelok into joining them. The second is Duty Propaganda. Some stalkers seem to believe in it, while others think it's bullshit, including duty members themselves. Finally, we can mention that two of the most knowledgeable groups, being the Ecologists and Clear Sky, never mention that the zone is growing. And of course, one of Freedom's commanders, Loki, even explicitly states that the zone does not expand. Up to this point, my conclusion was this. There are rumors that the zone is growing, but no real proof, and we must wait for Stalker 2 to find out. Now, with the newest trailer, we may have found a partial answer. In the trailer, the head professor for the Scientific Institute for Research in the Chernobyl Anomalous Area, which was established after Call of Pripyat, claims that the zone has been stable for years. Nonetheless, the news on the radio that can be heard afterwards seem to suggest otherwise. This makes me believe that the zone did not expand and stayed under control for a long time, during the several years that separate Call of Pripyat from the new game. And something will happen to disturb this balance, bringing back instability to the zone and triggering the start of Heart of Chernobyl's main story. Everlasting Fire Have you noticed that all fires in the zone seem to be eternal? Most locations are filled with campfires, which will continue to burn regardless of the conditions – wind, rain, thunderstorms, and even emissions, nothing can put them out. Sure, it could be simply explained by the fact that the devs were technically not able to implement this mechanic, but is this really the case? In some campfires, most notably underground, you can find bones and other rests of living creatures, which may be a hint that such fires were made and maintained by local mutants. Kinda creepy when you think about it. Furthermore, 
Campfires are not the only everlasting fires in the games. Candles also appear from time to time, but the strangest form of flames besides anomalies of course is this kind of fire. I mean, what exactly is burning here? There is no fuel. In some areas it seems that this fire is supposed to represent a very recent attack or explosion, like at the CNPP under siege by the military for example. The crash site in the wild territory is also an interesting occurrence of this phenomenon. Here the fire appears to have started naturally because of the fall of the chopper, however the flames never turn off and continue to burn forever. And before you ask, yes, they do damage. All of this points towards the idea that such fires are actually anomalies, or have at least become anomalous at some point. In previous videos, we have speculated that some electrical devices continue to work in the zone because they are powered by anomalous energy. This kinda makes sense. If the zone can create electro-anomalies, surely it can provide a bit of electricity for the local light bulbs. Then why not the same for fire? We have burner anomalies that make flames appear without any kind of fuel, so it is not impossible that fires that were once turned on naturally are kept ablaze by a similar anomalous phenomenon. Artificial Anomalies While we are on the topic of anomalies, it is time to talk about the artificial anomalies. For starters, I should point out that anomalies do not seem to appear randomly, at least not always. What I mean by that is the fact that specific conditions in the environment seem to increase the chance of a certain type of anomaly to appear. For example, the gas anomaly is usually found in swampy areas. Similarly, electro-anomalies appear more frequently near electrical equipment, such as power lines and transformers. As we just talked about, fire-based anomalies might spawn where a natural fire once burned, and so on. All of this makes me believe that it could be possible to arrange the terrain in order to favor the creation of anomalies. Going even further, some theories speak of so-called artificial anomalies, which were created in the secret X laboratories, either on purpose or by mistake. One particularly shocking example is the fruit punch anomaly, which looks like it could have been made from a chemical spill. In fact, one such fruit punch can be found in Laboratory X18, in a pool of unknown chemicals. In my opinion, the chemicals found here were used to experiment on living creatures, resulting in the creation of humanoid mutants, which are known for having some special abilities. So it is not out of question that these strange substances have wonderful properties similar to anomalies. Finally, I need to mention the concept of artifact activation. According to some, the developers had planned for artifacts to be usable by the player. Upon using an artifact, an anomaly would be created, but the artifact was to be lost in the process. While this feature did not make it into the final game, it is still directly mentioned by Yar in Clear Sky. In his dialogue, the technician claims that Freedom discovered that artifacts can generate anomalies. If this is true, artifacts could be considered like the fruits of anomalies, acting as a seed to create new anomalies. Imagine if the artifact you had in your pocket suddenly turned into a vortex anomaly. Or even worse, if all the artifacts that have already been smuggled out of the zone transformed into anomalies all at once. Eh, maybe it's best not to think about it. 
And that's it, that's gonna do it for the third layer. I hope you enjoyed. And stay tuned for the next episode, in which we will review the fourth layer, the laboratory. Good hunting, stalkers.